please ignore the state of my room. I am aware it is a mess, as is my life, but we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about books. We are starting a solo book vlog. This is a new thing that I'm going to be starting where I just sit down and I read one book and I talk about the one book as I read it. This is going to be a fun experiment because half the time I forget to update y'all. So like I'm going to have to actually put post-its in when I want to update for this one. What is the book you ask? Tis Ruin of Kings by Jen Lyons. From my understanding this is an epic fantasy series about someone who is like a lost prince or something. I just keep hearing about how good it is and I like fantasy and like here's the thing until I was doing booktube I wasn't someone who really read a lot of synopses unless the book caught my eye randomly in the bookstore. When destiny calls there's no fighting back. Kieran grew up in the slums of Kerr, a thief and a minstrel's son raised on tales of long-lost princes and magnificent quests. When he is claimed against his will as the missing son of a treasonous prince, Kieran finds himself at the mercy of his new family's ruthless power plays and political ambitions. Practically a prisoner, Kieran discovers that being a long-lost prince is nothing like what the storybooks have promised. The storybooks lied about a lot of other things too. Dragons, demons, gods, prophecies, true love, and how the hero always wins. Then again, maybe he isn't the hero after all. For Kieran is not destined to save the Empire. He's destined to destroy it. I am about 40 pages in, I think. Something like that. This is very Name of the Wind-esque, which Name of the Wind was not the first book to do this, sort of looking at it and looking back type of thing. You also see a lot of that with Robin Hobbs. Um, it's not there anymore because I returned it to the library because I don't know when I'm finishing it, but uh, Assassin's Farseer Trilogy. So this part so far is very interesting because it has one of my favorite kind of narrative techniques. So we find Kieran in prison at the very beginning of the book and he is being forced to tell us his story. Also on top of that, we have someone who is writing a letter to the king or something. I don't remember the emperor. Whoever they are, they just address them as your majesty. Um, and so as we go through this story that Kieran is telling us, this secondary narrator that is compiling all of this, it's almost like a, like, you know, some of those mixed media books where you will have like, oh, here I pulled all of these. These are the records from this. This is the record. This is this. this. It's like that, but high fantasy. So every now and then this secondary narrator will kind of interject and like give you a little more context for something. Like we met a character and it's like, so I've met this person and da -da -da, like gives you like a background stuff that the main character would not know as he is narrating this story. And then we have a second character that is occasionally taking over the primary narrative for parts that Kieran doesn't want to talk about um, because they have access to some of Kieran's memories and so they'll be in there while he's telling the story and, and be like you need to talk about this part I'm gonna if you won't say it I'm gonna say it which is really funny I know the footnotes bit like the interjecting narrator bit is not everyone's cup of tea but I absolutely adore it especially when you do it in the way that this audiobook is doing it so so far we have what's considered a full cast audiobook where we have Kieran has one Talon has a narrator and then our third kind of narrator that we don't really know who they are I mean we know their name Thurvishar Dolores Dolores I guess so Thurvishar is coming in and he's a separate voice so you there's a very clear distinction so it's almost like you've got this person kind of telling you a story and every now and then someone will be like by the way they're leaving out this important detail or they don't know this important detail um and so it's adding a little bit of like interesting character and I know that's not everyone's cup of tea but I really like that particular narrative technique I, it's fun for me I like where we are so far we haven't I haven't gotten very far um, we just got to the uh, the butterbelly part so I haven't got into spoilers just yet because I don't really have spoilers for this book um, and I will try to keep large chunks of it spoiler free so if you are wanting to read this book you can watch this vlog but since it is a vlog about a single book there will probably be points where I am going to be discussing spoilers I will try to make sure that those are clearly marked um, uh, both visually and in the timestamps but just to know you should probably check the timestamps I am assuming there will be a dragon at some point 
it. Oh, my battery's dying. I'm gonna go because I gotta go do things. Bye. We are checking in at about 114. Well, we just got past the 100 page mark. I'm on chapter 15 just going into. Um, it was nice. I was able to write it a chapter as I'm getting ready to go to bed. I am mildly confused right now. So when we're in the present, it makes it feel like a whole lot of time has passed since the, the, the past bits happened. But the past bits are six months before the main characters, before Karen's 16th birthday. And in the present, the only age that is mentioned is 16. And I'm just like, I, I wish we'd maybe had some date stamps so I could get an idea of how much time has passed between these two parts. Um, cause you have two separate timelines where you have a whole ton of questions and a whole lot of not answers. And the, the present timeline keeps referring to past events and I, either I'm too dumb to get it or I, we're being like, like I know, you, like she can't just dump all of that information on us. And I have a feeling that the past is going to lead up into the events that the present the present keeps referencing but oh my god is it so annoying for them to un like you feel like you're missing half the conversation when he starts talking about certain things because he's talking about them in these really vague terms that don't they, they don't tell you a lot about exactly what happened like you know something bad happened something went wrong yada 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 but like you have no idea what they, they're just like referencing it. I wish you'd just like in dialogue would just state what it is they're talking about because he's met a character that knows what happened and kind of seems to have an idea why that would have gone wrong um, that led to him being, because he's, when we meet him at the beginning of the book, he is in a slave market. He ends up getting sold to these characters that seem to know a little bit about who he is and his past. And so like he's talking in the present like he's known things about his past and about like the fact that he's a prince and all of this that he very clearly does not know in the past chapters and that's weird i'm liking it i like the world building so far and the character development is really like the way that she is revealing story and plot through character and the way that it, there's such a like clear difference between Kieran's chapters where he is narrating in the present and then Talon's chapters where she's narrating Kieran's life but each of these kind of have a little bit of a distinction between them to kind of make it not just separate from Kieran's point of view but like the point of view of the like the different points of view of the people that have observed him throughout his life these are all people that he's interacted with and has been close to uh because it seems like talon this assassin wh whatever thing um creature that is is uh making him tell this story talon is the one that's like hey i want you to tell talk talk into this it basically it's a magic stone and it records what he's saying that's a dnd &D idea if there ever was one you want to give your party a use magic item give them a stone they can talk into and record stuff you'd have to give them a way to play it back and i can see them like really taking that playing it back to shenanigans basically it it's kind of implied through the way things are going that talon has hunted down a lot of the people that were in kieran's life at this time trying to get to the bottom of something. I'm assuming that it's either him that they're after because he is supposedly the son of this long lost prince, or it is an item that he has um, that sounds like it probably could be used to prove that he is this long lost prince. I am intrigued. There are a lot of answers that I want from this book and I'm not getting them. I do know certain things about like the narration of the second book and all of that other stuff. And so I think like, I'm interested to see if I can find any of the Easter eggs that will be eggs, the Easter eggs. Yeah, you got to get eggs now instead of eggs because eggs are too expensive. I'm looking for, like, the different Easter eggs for the second book because I do know a little bit about, like, the narration and who the main character of the second book is. I am much happier in this book uh, with, like, how Jen Lyons is writing her female characters than uh, I am with other female authors I could name but um so far we've only we, like everyone we know has been a prostitute because he's raised in a brothel um which is I mean there are a lot of kids that got raised in brothels let's be honest it's interesting how she has 
seeded the different pieces of the fall of this emperor into people's lives um, and how it's had lasting effects even on people who are Kieran's age. I think he is about to do something that is very dumb and is going to do undo all of the things that his adoptive father has done. Oh, one other thought about like the world building is great because like you don't even realize she's doing the world building as she is doing the world building. So that's like if you're looking at a good way to bring world building into your story and have it be really well interwoven so far at least with your characters. Granted I am only a hundred pages in and we haven't had any big info dumps yet and we're gotten in a place where we need any big info dumps yet. It's really funny like we're, we're getting little pieces of like how the magic system works and the different levels of the magic system just in this argument between these two wizards that is happening right now. I'm really liking like how well she's integrated everything into everything and I don't like it's one of those things where you can just like it's interesting because you've got the world building that's just very like just kind of it's it's there like it feels natural and normal for the most part just there um except obviously the the interjections that we're getting from our uh omniscient narrator or whatever uh I don't know if it is it close basically he knows everything about this particular story because he's been doing research um where was I going with that? Oh, and then like the plot is there, but it's not. So it's one of those things like we've got a lot of character driven motion right now. And that character driven motion is being pulled along. But how do I how do I explain this? So like, we got a lot of character driven stuff going on right now. And the characters are moving us through the plot. But it's not like, like the, the main plot, the thing that is going to be the thing it's like it's just like like you can ju like just it's like when you have a word at the tip of your tongue and you can't think of it like that's what the plot feels like right now it's almost there I'll probably try and check in every 50 to 100 pages just when I have thoughts so that I have an actual vlog and not like hi I'm reading this book here's what I thought of it and it's the end of the vlog I has a theory I'm starting to think the theory is correct we have made it to page 173. It took me until about 20 minutes ago to realize that Ruin of Kings is like, I look at this cover and I, I feel like we're going to probably be dealing with some, you know, British lore. Not kind of thing. It does have all of the messiness of like the British medieval royals. Like so much, so much messiness. Really, like we've only been hearing about it in like We've only been hearing about it kind of secondhand because Kieran is not in that world as of right yet. However, it's so messy with all of the families and the, the way that everything goes. I do like the current emperor. Whether or not he is still the current emperor in the present, I don't know. But this poor kid, like we're, we're six months apart in these two perspectives and it's like, whoa. It feels like years have changed. But this is actually really reminding me of Roman history to some extent. And I really should have gotten the Roman history angle sooner um, when Kieran was talking about being uh, a galley slave because that was very much like that, that entire system, the way that he was describing very much how things, um, you know, I'm familiar with that from being homeschooled and studying Rome. I wish we were getting more of the present point of view. It feels like Jen Lyons is spending more time with like the past Kieran and the past point of view and so we're only getting snippets of Kieran in the present and it's like I wish we were getting more time with him in the present. Every time it feels like we are getting somewhere in the present timeline we're, we're, we're stuck st stuck back in the past again and it's like can we at least get some resolution of what is going on can can we can we like just like it we we had an entire sea battle with a kraken dragon thing it, it, very confusing but an entire sea battle that i'm like this like it, it it should have been just one chapter i'm sorry it needed to have just been one chapter there is definitely a skill in the way that jen lyons is doing this and the way that she is pacing this book and pulling you along through this book and using the different points of view to tell kieran's story and all of that but 
like it, it's getting a little frustrating. It feels like we are, we have one timeline where we're spending a lot of time and then we have another one where it feels like we are crawling. I'm gonna probably stop for now. I don't know, I might listen to some more, but I need to get some editing done and it'll probably go faster if I'm not listening to an audiobook while I'm getting through the clips. Very interesting though, we really are like, Jin Lyons is doing a very good job of making Kieran, like, his decision-making skills are of someone whose frontal lobe is not fully formed yet. He just tried to do an escape thing, and I'm just like, Sir, you're on an island. Do you have a boat? If they are underestimating you to this extent, gather a bit more information. Use their underestimation of you to your advantage. He's not quite as dumb as Fitz. Don't get me wrong, I love Fitz, but he's not quite as dumb as that poor boy. Oh, I wanted to mention, we have gotten to the point where Talon does the thing in the past uh, that happens right... If you've read the books, it's right before Talon and Kieran's first meeting in the past. Speaking of which, my theory... Okay, anyways, I think we have found out who Kieran's mother is. I'm not going to say anything about who it is, because I think, I, I, in general, I can talk about this without spoiling anything, so I'm just going to, I think we found out who Kieran's mother was. It's going to make things so complicated, and I am so here for it. Like, the layers there. But anyways, um, we have gotten to Kieran and Talon's first meeting, where he finds the people in the bed. That kind of hurted. I didn't really, um... Like, personally, I'm not too attached to those characters because I kind of, you kind of already know what's happened with them um, in the future. But, like, being there as the main character is experiencing that kind of gut punch moment hurts. Especially knowing that if he had made decisions a little bit differently, that would not have happened. I can't say any more than that without spoiling things, but... Anyways, I did want to tell you guys, I got to that point. Um, the people who've read the book probably know which one I'm talking about. Which moment. And if you don't, I guess you just have to read the book now. We just... We, 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 we just found out who Kieran's dad is. Um, and, and based on information... I mean, maybe it's not what it sounded like when she was saying that that's what he did. But based on the information we got about this man at at the big, earlier in in another timeline, um, I am disturbed. Yeah, I don't know how to feel about that. It is really like we've gotten more into the world, and I'm enjoying like enjoying that part. And I, I under I understand. I think I understand kind of like what is happening now when it comes to the two separate timelines. I still do wish that we were splitting our time a little bit more evenly, but I get what is going on here with 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 the book. I don't know where I am, actually. We have made it to page 214. I am at 38% of this book, and I, I need to have it finished by tomorrow if I want to, to, uh, not fail my TBR game. Like, if I don't finish something, one of these books, at some point, I will have finished none of the books from my TBR, and I don't know what to do with that. I, I just may not sleep tomorrow night. I just, I just, Saturday might just be, it might just be a really long Friday. Good morning, everyone. It is Saturday morning. I am currently getting ready to make myself some breakfast. And uh, we have a book to talk about. You know, you would think that I would have grabbed everything out of the fridge before I started talking to y'all um, and made sure everything was ready for me to just go ahead and cut it. Did I? Yeah. <laughs> you can tell the spinach is a little old. Um, so we are currently, I finally made it to the halfway point, speaking of, finally made it to the halfway point in Ruin of Kings. Um, and a lot of pieces have started falling into place. This family, uh, I'm starting to think they have to be very, very like, 
there's just some stuff going on. And so it's really interesting seeing, uh, I, I'm assuming that nothing good will last. So uh, I just, I'm trying not to get too attached to anybody because that's, that's how these books typically go, right? Um, but it is like, like the amount of machinations and everything that is going on. Kind of hope that this kid ends up uh, eventually destroying his not father. Um, we, we figured that one out as well. She has a thing with ages. I really wish, because I spent, there's, there's, there's a, a burgeoning relationship between um, our main character and a couple, like a couple of characters. And it's very, um, maybe I missed it in the description that talked about how old they were, but it really did feel like this kid was, uh, who was 16, which makes him a child, was uh, sleeping with an adult. And I'm just like, in being having made moves made on him by an adult when age-wise for the particular time period, they are actually very much, seems like they are in kind of his actually in his age range based on a description we just got of one of them at least so I'm like okay so this feels a lot more appropriate but just like I spent a good hour going okay guys but, but he's a child I know he is 16 and that makes him an adult in your society but he's a child fantasy settings it's always tricky because there are a lot of people that um have heard the the uh common misconception that especially women and girls got married very very young like talking about 13 14 15 um is when they would get married and here's the thing that was very common in royal houses that did happen um you do find though that even at 13 14 15 like here's an example Catherine of aragon and prince arthur they were 15 when they got married i believe arthur might have been 16. and the thing was is part of the reason they didn't have any kids is because the way that they did things were they had the night to consummate the marriage and then they lived in separate houses because even at in their mid-teens they were still deemed too young to be regularly sexually active with their spouse. Even in the Middle Ages there was still some idea that there is a point where you're actually ready for a relationship or ready you know for um, serious sexual advances and things like that. And Even then there was like like it didn't always happen. You had a lot of very young teenage girls that ended up Henry VIII's mother, grandmother was one of them that ended up um, married. But Henry VIII's mother had Henry VII and was barren for the rest of her life. So if she she's not going to be the only person that got pregnant at twelve and had a, or had a I think it's, she got pregnant at 12 and either had the child at 12 or, or, at, or, or had him at 13. Young girls' bodies are not ready to, to carry children and give birth at that age. And so you're going to notice, society is going to notice when you have, when like most of the 12 year olds and 13 year olds that are getting married and having children are dying, society is going to notice and be like, nah. And then when you talk about the common folk, like people who didn't have money money, the comic fo common folk typically actually got married in their early to mid 20s. But that's, that's a, the, because the rich, rich people who are the people we have the most information about were marrying their children off at 14, 15, 16 for political reasons, that's the misconception that we have. So like, there's always a little bit of grace I give because people think that it's appropriate for like a 16 year old to be sleeping with someone who's in their mid 20s. Um, at, because of the time period. Anyways, I just went off on a whole tangent. Like this is definitely, I think, probably grimdark. Um, I often have, like, sometimes people will talk about something and call it grimdark, and I'm like, what, how is that? I don't, like I understand, and I'm not an expert on grimdark, but I understand why Robin Hobb is considered grimdark, but like, I don't know, I read Assassin's Apprentice and I'm like, how is that? Like, it's it's sad, but I've read YA books that have that same kind of uh, horrific amount of abuse piled on the main character by the author. Uh, but anyways, there are, uh, there's a lot of talk about agency in this um, and whether or not consent is given. And I love, I love, we're, we're just having a conversation um, where, uh, Kieran is talking about one of the slaves and he goes, 
she's a slave. Like, she wasn't allowed, like, did, did, she, like, basically, like, she couldn't, was she allowed to consent to anything, um, or able to consent to anything when she was your slave? Um, and so there's a lot of talk about that, and I really appreciate that. There is a lot of abuse from characters in the novel that is being heaped on our main character because of the situation he is currently in. Um, and then we also, he was a slave, so we know he came from a very abusive situation when we meet him at the beginning of the book. And I'm really, like, the fact that it is so unapologetic, like, there's no amount of trying to justify it in our main character's mind. He knows it's wrong. And he is, he's not afraid to call it as wrong. And, and part of that is because he is this young boy who was raised, you know, kind of, he, he, he didn't grow up in this kind of royal society and he is seeing these things that his uh, father is being allowed to do and he's like no this is wrong and he's not afraid to call out that it's wrong. He's getting a lot of shit thrown at him because he is not backing down um, which I totally like he's gonna Darzan is gonna abuse him either way like whether he whether he is and we see that through his brother um, Gal Galen. Both both reactions are appropriate for what is going on. There are a lot of um, conversations being had about not willpower, free will, and agency, and things like that. And I really, I am in, I'm enjoying that. I'm enjoying how there is not a single, like, you'll see some of the richer characters trying to justify slavery and those kinds of things, but there's not a single moment with Kieran that he's like, yeah, this is okay. Um, every moment, it's like, nope, this is wrong from the very beginning, like even before he was enslaved. Uh, we haven't gotten to the point where we know how that happened yet. This is a very like, I really do feel that, that probably Robin Hobb was a very, a definite inspiration on this. I'm feeling some Patrick Rothfuss vibes for um, Name of the Wind, that book. I'm feeling a lot of like, it's, it's a lot of Oh God, where was that thought going? Like it's a lot of kind of that vibe of storytelling um, with an awareness that I don't think either of those authors really seem to have in their narrative and in how they treat their characters. So I'm really enjoying it. Like, a, I don't know if enjoying it based on what we've just, like, I don't know that, if that's, that's correct. But um, it's, it's a good book. Again, I do feel like I am continually kind of feeling like this should have just been two separate books. I, I, like, I understand what she's doing and why she's doing it narratively, and I understand that a lot of the time you don't get to have a second book, but, like, there is a part of me that's just like, you know, this, I would have liked this better if it had been the one book with the past perspective and the one book with the present perspective. And I know that they're going to feed into each other, but that's something that you do in a series. So you very much could have, she could have just split this into two separate books. I have to like, I respect the craft and, and how she's doing this and, and the, the way that she is, um, you know, leading the reader through this narrative. I'm sure that there is going to, I'm, I'm gonna find that there is more, um, what's the word? Like there's, I, there's gonna be a, you know, I'm not leaving out the fact that there's probably a greater reason for having both of these narratives in the same book. Um, I just would have done it differently, primarily because of reader experience. How much time do I have left on my timer? I just spent 12 minutes. I could have been reading, but I wasn't. What is, what am I talking? I got 20 minutes. Oh yeah, I can, I can, I can finish my eggs. This might be too much spinach. There's also some very interesting conversations in regards to magic and like power going on here. Um, that I really like. I want, I want more of Emperor Sardis. I like him. Like the one scene we've gotten of him, I really enjoyed him as a character. I think he would have been fun to follow for a hot minute. I'm gonna go finish making my breakfast so I can listen to more book and also be back upstairs when sprints are over. We are here with what may be the final update. Um, I'm not entirely sure because uh, we're at page 400 and I assume that uh, stuff is about to go down and the next time I check in with y'all I will have finished the book. Sir Bashar is officially my favorite character. There's like a footnote from him where he's like, I actually care very much about what people think of me because if they are afraid of me they are less likely to interrupt me while I'm reading and I'm just like, what a man. I'm enjoying this so much. We've gotten, as we've gotten into the latter part of the book, while yet again the back and forth every chapter is still frustrating me because like 
My dude, what? Every time, every time you get me, like, I wouldn't mind it as much if these, ch some of the chapters at least, were ending on a, like, some sort of resolution to what's being brought up in that chapter instead of being cut off in the middle of something. Um, but, like, so many of them just feel like we, we d we're not getting the full story, and then it's the next, you know, it moves on to another point of view. And, like, I'm sorry, my my brain needs more consistency than that. We've kind of gotten what the, uh, the ultimate thing that is going on with our main character is. We've gotten, gotten that. We know who he is and what's going on. This particular world really likes to play with reincarnation, um, and people coming back from the dead, um, we spend most of this book at the Temple of the Death Goddess. We've just, like, actually met our narrator in, well, not just, like, it's been a few page, few chapters, but we, we've just met our narrator in the text. Tereith and Tienso are both growing on me. I love them. Doc is a hoot. So, like, I'm definitely enjoying it, um, and I'm very curious to see what happens next. Um, like I said, it's really, like, even, even though I don't particularly, I'm not, particularly pleased with the structure I still have to admit that like she's doing a really good job um and then we also just found out something about uh how this the stone of shackles got where it was in regards to Kieran's mother um but anyways there is there is a lot going on right now. For a series titled A Chorus of Dragons, currently there are not a lot of, like, there's one dragon that we've seen. Uh, but we're not dealing a lot with, you'd expect them to be a little bit more pers persistent problem. I have, I have suspicions about, uh, hold on. I'm too lazy to go back and check, but I, I have a feeling that, um, I have a feeling the Ruin of Kings might actually be a dragon. Hello, we're here with a final update. Because I finished this like a week ago, but I've been waiting for daylight. So I can give you guys my final thoughts on Ruin of Kings. Whew! The ending of this book. So many things are going on, guys. I ended up giving this four stars. It, like, the only thing this was missing was a really, really good, like, romance. And we didn't have that. I needed that. I definitely felt the lack of it in this, but this was also like, so here's the thing. Again, I still personally would have preferred like, instead of going back and forth the way that we were going to have gone all the way through. I understand why and what she was doing with that structure. I think it is really, really well done the way that she does it, especially how she takes that around and then wraps it up at the end. Sad at the same time, it just, that was really frustrating to like, and it wasn't just like, like this happened once or twice, but you would get to a specific point in the story and then it would switch to the next perspective without any, like you'd have to wait for the next chapter for the resolution of what was going on or what, what you were leading up to instead of resolve and, and then that frustrated me to an extent. However, I really enjoyed it. The ending of this book is so like wild i had so much like so many things that i was like this has to be what's happening we're coming into play and i would, like it's so wonderful and complicated and like i know the next book is not following these characters i think we don't see them until the end of the next book like i know things about things but oh my god i want like I want more of, of these characters i want to see where this goes i am intrigued like the characters Thurvishar is still the one that, like, I really, like, it's my favorite. I don't really care, I'm gonna be honest, I don't really care about a lot of, like, I care about them, but they're not, like, I'm not attached to them. Like, Kieran could have died, and I would have been okay with it, which is maybe not the best thing when you're the main character. This is a new experience for me, by the way. Usually it, it, like, there, anyways. So, but I love Thurvishar. Thurvishar was just, he was such a mood the entire time. Um, and so I'm really interested to see where this goes, because I feel like this is one that I'm not attached now, but I may be by the end when we get further. There is a lot going on with Kieran that, like, just kind of got dumped on him at the very end, and then he gets in a position, he's not, he doesn't remember any of that, so it's gonna be real fun when we find, get to the moment where he does remember some of what's going on, and what's happening, and puts all of the pieces together, because we as the reader are going to, like, because of the way events go, we as the reader are going to know things 
um, or suspect things that he currently does not know and or suspect because of things that happened. This is not going to work for everyone because of the way that it is structured. There are a lot of people that would want something, I'm not going to say more cohesive, I can't think of the word, but there is some variety in the different ways that this story works and the way that this story is told. So the way that it works is that we have that introduction, we follow Kieran's story in the past and in the present for the majority of the book, and then we kind of come back in with that same original point of view that started the story to wrap it up. So it's not like it's if you're if you're someone who needs everything to be the same throughout the book, it's not going to be that. I don't know how you could have told this story without doing this way. It's a little bit unorthodox in the way that it is structured. However, like the way that that works, works really well for the book that it is and for what is going on. Like the what really stands out to me for this, again, like characters are okay. Uh, what really stands out to me for this was the world building, the political plots, a lot of the relationships with the characters are really, really interesting. One of the things that I really do like that she, and you can tell a woman wrote this, is she has conversations around consent, not just in regards to women, but also in regards to our main character, in regards to some of the things that do happen to him um, when he is a teen. There's a lot of that. There's a lot of conversation in regards to power um, and how people use it in politics. A lot of this is very, very based on um, the Roman Empire. You can see it, it was ridiculous that it took me as long as it did to figure that out, especially considering like the first thing they mention is a giant stadium. My brain was off, apparently. My brain was just off for the first, I don't know, half of this book before I was like, oh, oh, I get what's going on here. For some reason, like I saw a dragon, I thought medieval Europe, but it's not, it's not. It's very much more based on, um, especially in the way that society is structured in this novel, very based on Rome. This is fun. Uh, I'm going to pick up the second book as soon as possible so I can kind of keep up with the read along that people are doing. Probably will be a little bit behind, especially because... I am going to need all of my hoopla borrows this month for all the books that I have here. If you're looking for an interesting, I guess you'd say char like character driven, political epic fantasy, definitely pick this up. We are, we're not like this very much is one where it's starting in the humble beginnings. This is the humble beginnings, but you can see the way that the story, or I can see, I don't know about everybody, I can see the way that the story is going to escalate and be um, kind of like the stakes are going to rise. Like the characters in here do not yet, or some of them, some of them probably do, but not everyone yet knows what the full extent of like what's going on is. Um, and like the full extent of uh, the consequences or the full stakes what's well, really at risk. It's been hinted at, it's been told to them, they haven't quite comprehended it. So you as the reader know things that, or understand things, the characters do not yet understand because we have the benefit of being outside the story and hindsight. Like it's not even, some of it is plot, plot points and story beats and if you read fantasy you're gonna know this stuff. But a lot of it is just that like you as the, the reader are able to put all of the pieces together from all of the different points of view, whereas you have characters that they may have like, they, they're not going to pick up on certain hints because they're everyday things. Like, it's a very good example of that, where, like, there are certain things that happen that they're just going to see as something that, that happened to them, but you as a reader, knowing that this is a book, are going to be like, that means something. Thank you so much for watching. If you would like to see any more of my vlogs where I focus on specific books, I'll have them right over here. You can check out whatever is the newest one on my channel. And yeah, that's, that's, I don't feel like doing a full outro. So thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. That is it for now, my friends. Happy reading. And I will see you later when we will talk about more wordy, nerdy things. Bye.